Okay, so welcome back to this video in which we are talking about the pore of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so uh, we were just about to look at the uh, subunit composition of the neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So let's do that now. Okay, so if we look at a picture uh, which is basically looking at this sort of receptor picture here from above. So we're going to look down on our receptor from the extracellular fluid. And I suppose I should have written that on here. This side is the extracellular fluid, the extracellular compartment, and this side is the cytoplasm. Okay, I suppose it didn't really matter because I, the way I'd drawn it was perfectly symmetric, but it matters for this picture here. This side is the extracellular fluid, and this side down here is the cytoplasm. Okay, right, so now let's have a look at the subunit composition of the neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So the neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is often called the alpha-1-2, beta-1, delta, epsilon, heteropentamer. So you'll often see this referred to as the alpha-1-2, beta-1, delta, heteropentama. And you can see why it's called a heteropentama. Hetero means different. Pentama means uh, something consisting of five subunits. We have basically used different genes to code for the different proteins that we are putting in these five slots here. Okay, and therefore that's why it's called a heteropentamer because we haven't used the same gene to code for all five subunits. If you did use the same gene to code for all five subunits that you were going to put into this uh, pentamer, uh, then it would be a homopentamer, homo meaning same. Okay, right, so uh, let's have a look at the structure of this uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor from above because just knowing the subunit composition doesn't tell us the actual structure of it because how should these be arranged relative to one another we know that we've got two alpha one subunits or one beta one subunit and a delta and an epsilon subunit but we don't know how they should be arranged relative to each other so here's the pore in the middle okay and let's divide this into the five separate subunits here one, two, three, four, five. So, uh, this subunit here will make an alpha-1 subunit, and this one here will also be an alpha-1 subunit. So there's one subunit sitting in between these two alpha-1 subunits. They're not sitting next to each other, basically. Okay, then the subunit that is sitting between them is the epsilon subunit, and then over here you have the beta-1 subunit, and here is the delta subunit. So that is the uh, way they are arranged relative to each other in this alpha-1-2, beta-1, delta, uh, epsilon, so, um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So let's just colour these in. So we'll colour the alpha-1 subunits in this blue colour here. Okay, whoops. Uh, we'll colour the epsilon subunit in uh, this pink colour. Okay, so epsilon is in pink. And we'll colour beta 1 in orange. Okay, so here's beta 1. And then finally we'll have delta in green. Okay, so this is the uh, subunit composition of uh, the neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, where are the acetylcholine binding sites on this um, extracellular domain of this uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor? And also, how many of them do you have? Well, basically, the acetylcholine binding sites are between two subunits. Okay, so you have one between this alpha-1 subunit and the delta subunit, and you have another acetylcholine binding site between this alpha-1 subunit and this epsilon subunit. So these are the acetylcholine, which I'll just denote as ACH, binding sites. Okay, right. Now, we're not so interested in this video about the acetylcholine binding sites. What we are interested in is when we look at the structure of uh, each one of these subunits, remember, each one of these subunits is a protein in its own right, so each one of them looks like this, basically. Our question is how is this arranged, basically? Which one of these alpha helices that spans the membrane is lining the pore, i.e., 
if I was an ion, or if I was a little man, and I was able to walk through this um, this pore, which um, membrane-spanning alpha helice of each one of these subunits would I uh, be in contact with? Well, basically, the answer is the M2 subunit here. Oh, sorry, the M2 membrane-spanning alpha helix. Okay, so let me show this in again. Let me draw this picture again, but this time let me put the orientation of the um, five uh, membrane-spanning alpha helices for each one of these. So, if I draw this picture again, so here's this cartwheel-like picture again. Okay, and here's the pore of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and it consists of these uh, five subunits, so it's this heteropentema. Okay, now, let's look at how one of these subunits is actually positioned within its space, basically. So, it will have the M2 uh, membrane-spanning alpha helix actually facing the pore, and that goes for all of them. So, here are their M2 membrane-spanning alpha helices here. So, should I colour this in red? Because I've coloured the... Uh, in fact, I'm going to redraw the picture of... Uh, the membrane-spanning topology of a single subunit down here so that we've got it nearby and we're not having to continue flipping between that picture up there and this picture down here. So here's the cis loop again. Here's the membrane-spanning alpha helices, M1, M2, M3, and finally M4. And I haven't shown the M3, M4 loop particularly big here, but never mind, we're not discussing that anyway in this video. So, this is the M2 loop in red, and all of them have their M2 loops positioned facing the pore. So this is what makes up the pore of this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the M2 subunits. Okay, then all of them will have their M1 subunits sitting next to the M2 subunits. Okay, so let's have it like so. So, let's have these as the M1 subunits. So, this is the M1 subunit. Okay, so in blue, this is M1. And then finally, we'll put in M3 and M4. So, M3 and M4 will then be... M3 will be the one that's closer to M2. So, the two that actually surround M2 will be the ones that are closer to it, M1 and M3 here. Okay, so we'll have this representing M3 here. Again, then M4 is just going to have to be crowded in, basically. Fitting in where there's space. So we'll then put M4 maybe somewhere like that. Okay, and this is a cartoon. The main point to take from this is that the M2 uh, membrane-spanning alpha helix is lining the pore. So don't read too much into this. Okay, so here are these four alpha helices. Right. Okay, so M2 lines the pore. How do we know that? How, what experiment can you do that shows that this M2 region in red here lines the pore? Well, basically, what you do is you make chimeras. Okay, so what you can do is you can go to uh, cows, okay, so you can go and take the bovine nicotinic acetylcholine uh, receptors from cows, okay, and you can specifically look at this delta subunit. We, I think when they did this experiment, they specifically looked at the delta subunit. So we go to cows and we take the bovine delta subunit, okay. We also go to a type of fish known as a torpedo. Now, a torpedo is not a specific type of fish. A torpedo is an entire genus of fish. So if you remember um, your uh, ways of classifying uh, animals, or in fact all life, your classification for life, it was kingdom, i.e. whether you were in the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom, the bacterial kingdom, and then that other kingdom that no one's ever heard of, the protists. Okay, then you have phylum within a uh, kingdom, and I think that's things like vertebrates and invertebrates, basically. Um, then after that, kingdom, phylum, class, after that. And then finally, order, 
Okay. And then it continues going down. Family. So family would be like the cat family, the uh, wolf family, things like that. And then genus within a family. And then species. Okay. So our species is Homo sapiens. But our genus is Homo. And our, the, our specific species within genus is Homo sapiens. So basically... Uh, this is not one species of fish. This is a bunch of species of fish. It's a genus. Okay, and the way of remembering this is kings play chess on fiery golden sands. Okay, right. Uh, so, this is a bunch of fish, basically. This is a genus of fish. Okay, and uh, these fish are basically those ray fish, or what a child would call a flat fish. So, they kind of look like this sort of thing, and they sort of swim along the sort of sand. It's what's in Finding Nemo, and all the, the little fish sort of ride on the back. It's the equivalent of the school bus in Finding Nemo. Okay, so torpedo is a genus of ray fish. Okay, so you go to cows and you go to these uh, torpedo fish. And uh, you take the delta subunits from cows, and you also take the delta subunits of the nicotinic acetylcholine uh, receptor from these torpedo fish. Okay, and what you find is that if you make a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which so one of these skeletal muscle nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which has the delta subunit from the torpedo ray fish, then it has a high conductance. So the conductance is very high if you um, use the delta subunit from the torpedo ray fish, okay? So it will allow a lot of ions to come through it. Uh, if you use this delta subunit, the number of ions that will actually go through the pore of your nicotinic acetylcholine receptor in a minute will be very high. Whereas if you use the bovine delta subunit in your skeletal muscle nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, then your conductance is very low. Okay, so the number of ions that go through that receptor in a minute is very low. Okay, right. Now, basically, if, if these two subunits have a different conductance, then that must mean that they have something different with regards to the portion of the subunit which uh, actually lines the channel, basically. So, if they have a different conductance, it must mean that the portion of this delta subunit that lines the channel is different between these two delta subunits. That follows. Okay, so what they did, let me go over onto the other page, is they made a chimera. Okay, so what they did is they took this delta subunit, which remember will have membrane spanning topology like so, okay, and they took most of the bovine delta subunit, which remember is this subunit that has a low conductance. So most of this is going to be the bovine delta subunit. However, what they're going to do is they're going to replace the M2 membrane spanning alpha helix with the uh, torpedo M2 membrane spanning alpha helix. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to take the torpedo delta subunit, they're going to chop out this M2 membrane spanning alpha helix, and they're then going to go to the bovine, um, the bovine de nicotinic acetylcholine receptor delta subunit, they're going to chop out the M2 region of that and insert in the torpedo M2 membrane spanning alpha helix. So basically all of the red bit is bovine, is the cow bit. And all of this M2 bit, this green bit, is the torpedo. Now, what they found is that if they use this chimera of a delta subunit, this chimera delta subunit, and a chimera just means that you've got a mix of two things. So, for instance, Buckbeak out of Harry Potter is a chimera of an eagle with a horse. I think it's a horse that it is. Um, okay, so it's two things mixed together, basically. So this is a mix of the bovine delta subunit and also the torpedo delta subunit. Okay, and if you take this and put it into a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, then the conductance of that 
uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor will be the conductance of uh, the torpedo one because the torpedo one's M2 subunit, which is the portion that lines the pore, is here. And that was how they found uh, that um, it was the M2 subunit. That's how they concluded that it was this M2 membrane spanning alpha helix uh, which was lining the pore. Okay, so they obviously, when they were actually doing this as a scientific experiment, they didn't just make this chimera. They made absolutely loads of chimeras. They tried making uh, mixes of every single bit. So they will have tried just replacing the M1 subunit, M1 membrane spanning alpha helix with uh, the um, torpedo M1 uh, membrane spanning alpha helix. And when I say M1 subunit, I'm making a mistake. It sh I should be saying the M1 membrane spanning alpha helix, and I do apologize for that. Okay, so they made absolutely loads of chimeras and saw which one would uh, return the conductance of this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor back up to the torpedo's conductance. And they found that it, it was the one where they inserted in this M2 membrane spanning alpha helix from the torpedo delta subunit into the bovine delta subunit. Okay. So we'll continue this story in the next video where we'll look at the structure of the membrane spanning alpha helix that is lining this pore, which is this M2 alpha helix.